welcome back. Um, my objective this morning is to try, I've already installed stockfish for C called Seafish, um, with like the letter C and then the word fish. And now I've just installed Rust. Um, I tested this with a Rust Chess engine. And now I'm trying to install the Corrode uh, C to Rust cross compiler. It's not a perfect cross compiler and they give all kinds of disclaimers, but I think for purposes of the chess engine, we'll see if it works or not. It probably won't, um, but that doesn't mean I can't be enthusiastic or I don't know. Um, so let's see. Uh, start, sure you have GHC in the Kabbalah install tool, follow the directions on Haskell.org. You also need to have Happy and Alex tools installed. So let's install Happy. Uh, Cabal update tells me what the packages from Haskell.org are. This is my first time using Haskell. Um, hopefully it's not my last because I've heard many good things about it. I mean surely I'll more experiences with Haskell in the future and probably be pro be pro nah, be more prolific with it. Um, I understand it's a wonderful language. Um, it makes some makes many tasks easier to develop, but um, takes sufficient foresight to recognize that doing everything in C or C++ or Java or .NET or your favorite hammer and or nail of choice is not the appropriate uh, tool for usage. You want to make sure that you're using proper tools for proper projects. Um, so, um, so yeah, we just uh, got the Cabal installer and GHC installed. I'm just following the examples here, basically. I do not understand what the GHC environment, toolkit, library, whatever it is, is. I understand the Cabal install is an installer for installing modules. Um, oh, I haven't even... yeah. Uh, I have not even sourced my .profile file that has my path in it, so let's do that. And then I could do cabal install to get the remainder of everything else I'm supposed to have installed. Uh, can't find cabal .cabal file in here. Got it. Um, wait. Alright. Oh, I have to download corrode. That's what's next here. Um, so we get over to GitHub and we search for the corrode. Um, this is the one. The automatic semantics preserving translator from C to Rust. I have to get this and install it myself, which I can do. Git clone this, cd corrode, cabal, install, whoops, um, usage does not involve that period, I don't know, um, I don't know whether that period there would be supported or not, probably not, probably would make no sense to say install a module that has a name that has no letters in it. Um, this puts the corrode executable post compilation in my home directory slash cabal or slash dot cabal slash bin. So ensure that, yeah, that location is in my path. Um, which we just did. We sourced my dot profile file, which has that dot cabal path inside my path inside my environment variable that goes by the name of path. Uh, there's alternate instructions for installing corrode uh, using stack. Um, not bothering with that at the moment. Alright, there are two ways to use corrode. You can simply generate 
a .rs file from the C source, or you can do this and, compi and compile in one step. Um, okay, so it looks like the crow tool accepts one C file and translates it. Um, but it does not make any attempt to check semantics because C is a complex language and what have you. Um, so let's go back to Cfish and say crow with all warnings enabled. Do we have make the main? What do we have here in Cfish? Oh, let's change directory to source. Uh, do we have a main? We do have a main. Corrode. Warning. Main.c. I. User. Local. Include. M. Corrode doesn't handle this yet. Argv. Alright. Um, oh, is that it? Did it exit with warnings? Okay, first of all, can I get this to compile? This project. Cfish. Um, oh, never mind. There's no readme on explaining how to build this. Uh, there is a make file. So semantics are probably just make build. Um, probably don't have to do what I do normally for Stockfish, which is supply the architecture. I don't know if there's any advantage or disadvantage to this. Oh, I uh, clean. Let's do another make build. This time specifying the architecture, even though it could probably be inferred. And perhaps was. Alright, so this project does compile under C. Um, you can even run Cfish. And you can say go, I don't know, perfed 8. Search the starting position for everything 8 moves deep. And yeah, it'll take however long it takes. Which could take a while. You can also say perfed 2. You could say perfed 4. Uh, and so forth. Yeah, searching 8 moves deep is a bit of a larger task. And this uh, Cfish is slightly dated too. But okay, the Cfish does itself compile and run. So when I say corrode the main.c, um, corrode does not yet handle this thing that goes on in uci.h. Um, so yeah, I need to better appreciate what it is that I am attempting to do before progressing too much further. Um, mm -hmm. I'll use the options that are relevant to the C preprocessor. Uh, unlike a compiler, it does not produce an object file or executable. If you ask to process a C file, it generates equivalent Rust source code. If you do want object code, there is a script. Um, no, I just want to generate all the Rust code, make that into a separate directory. Okay, let's try something perhaps simpler. Is there a simpler, let's say, make clean here first? We get an inventory of what exists in here. Config.h. Oh, I wonder. I don't suppose that I can corrode a .h file. Um, okay. So, <laughs> an empty file. Nice one. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't suppose. Okay, well, I guess that makes sense. Hey, it works. Beautiful. Um, no, let's let's take a look at Time Man. Time Man dot C. Um, okay, is this something that we can attempt to corrode? Uh, let's take a look at this. See, like time man .rs. Okay, it actually did produce something. Um, and then we try to do this for the .c file. Yeah, so we get equivalent Rust file for the C file. Um, so if I want to corrode all of the C files, um, I don't know. Can I say star.c? Is this too ambitious? Two input files given. I'm pretty sure that's more than two, but okay, yeah, that, that, that looks very much like two. Never mind. You're right. Um, no. Nah. So... I don't suppose that... Uh, actually, here's an interesting thing. Maybe... Maybe we use a char pointer pointer instead of a char array. Maybe this is um, my difference here. Again, me not having worked with the Rust, Haskell, or basically any of this before. It's just a bit of a interesting... I'm considering this more of a game. Like an arcade-style game, trying to figure out, like, what is it that I can do that results in an error? Um, where I just hit a button, see what happens, um, and see if I can correct it. This is like the Chinese room experiment. Um, okay, how about this? Does that compile? A simple char does not fit here. Ooh, that's no good. Um, uh, UCI.h line 80. Wait, what? That's interesting. So I'm supposing that Corrode has some interesting semantics when it comes to arrays. Um, or, sorry, with character pointers because C by default makes character pointers a single letter or a single um, what's it an 8 byte wide character but Rust I read by default supports Unicode with 32 um, byte I'm sorry 32 bit characters 1 byte versus 4 byte um, so the symbol char does not fit here. Yeah, I, I don't think that this is necessarily going to go so great um, for all the files. Uh, get checkout. Here, let's try to do this without touching any of the .h files. Or at least not any more than we have to. I'm pretty sure that I could get a interesting representation of stockfish or seafish source code in Rust um, without some of the more... Oh, I was just missing a semicolon. Well, okay. Let's give that a shot then with a semicolon before I jump too far to conclusions. Um, so, yeah, let's... Most of these say char space star. Here he was giving doing a distinction of char uh, star array, but I think this is fine. So now we have our semicolon. Can I corrode main.c? Yes. Um, and we see it's not anything too well, whatever. It's <laughs> 
we pulled in a ton of interesting things from main.c that I'd not necessarily expect to see here, but um, maybe it works. Can't knock it there. Uh, for i in star.c, do echo dollar i done. And then we're going to substitute this in there. Um, so instead of echo dollar i, it's going to be this thing for each C file. There we go. Uh, there's a lot of things that Corrode can't handle yet. <clears throat> um, a lot of these seem to deal with bit shifting and arrays. Um, perhaps a chess engine is not the best test for Corrode, but um, we'll see. Um, 189 here. Oh, yep, yep, yep. So let's try this, maybe. Um, Opt type string at line 164. I understand that there are semantic differences in usages of um, arrays versus other types in C. Unfortunately, I've been there and gotten hit by that before. Uh, doesn't support size of. That doesn't surprise me. Um, <laughs> check whether real check whether a real C compiler accepts this st check squares for a non-existent field. That's not good. Um, I mean, I didn't like undefine a field here, so yeah, the fact that Rust can call out that we have a non-existent field is pretty special. Um, is this really the case? Did I miss something here? Grab check squares and all my things. Um, I mean, we saw that whatever it was that I compiled did compile. Um, so, oops. And yes, this file is imported from places, so... Oh wait, check squares is an array. It's um, a seven element array. Right, so... I think this is not going to go well because C does this all by defining arrays and Rust would do it. I'm not sure how Rust would handle. I have an object of a fixed dimension that I need you to allocate for me. Um, that's interesting. Because that's something I don't want to change its dimension for. Um, how about the rest of these, though? How far can I get? Atomic store pointer. Key does not fit here. Yeah, it's probably just that Corrode can't handle the translation then. Yeah, it would have surprised me if. Um, Rust didn't have a way of doing that. Either that or Rust was just too not mature of a language to handle that, but that would be pretty surprising at this point. Um, okay, so what's our first error here? Crow doesn't handle that yet. 
I mean, we saw that ultimately this probably isn't going to go well because um, there are a number of things Corrode can't do. But let's see how far we can get and see if I can make up the difference. Um, things like this here, where we're doing size of with pointers, is a bit advanced and Corrode can't. A what? Now, this is amusing. I mean, yeah, I get that C arithmetic is special. Um, I mean, I more so get it with this, where you're doing bit shifting. And this depends on the width of your data type and stuff like that. So I get that Corrode might struggle with that, but this seems fairly unambiguous. I could probably substitute in whatever it is that I want to do in these instances. You know, it'd be nice if Corrode had like an unsafe mode where it was able to do such translation and say, you know, this might not be correct, but um, this is what the translated file looks like. Um, anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Syntax error! Exclamation point. Rook masks does not fit here. On line one. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so there's basically arrays all over the place in AHS Engine. Um, are most of the things like this? I mean, I get that these preprocessor directives or defined variables aren't cross compilable. Um, whoops. Um, but that aside, it seems like most of this can be handled. Search PV cannot be defined here. Yeah, I guess... or does not fit. You know, I'm wondering if part of that has to do with the preprocessor directives and this being defined twice. Um, I'm not sure. But yeah, there's arrays everywhere. This is not going to go well. I need to find a more basic chess engine than this to cross-compile. Um, I don't suppose that, yeah, no, it's just a module. It doesn't come with a command line usage document. Um, So we did get six files compiled out of about, uh, let's count it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, oh, it is 30. 10 across, three down. And that's my alarm. Let me go get that. So... Yeah, I think I should try to find a more primitive um, C chess engine than Seafish. Seafish has got some things that uh, Corrode can't quite handle yet. Um, Corrode was last updated um, April 12th. So it is still under active development. Um, it's even got some Travis continuous integration built in. Um, 411 commits. So it's some pretty substantial or indecisive development. Make of it what you will. Um, actually, Chess might not even be the right domain to do this sort of um, measurement in. Fast chess that uses bit boards to play chess with Ruby. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember seeing there was a really simple chess AI. Um, a simple chess program. Chinese chess, a tiny chess AI. All right. 
so how about this one? Does this have source that like looks scary and stuff? It's got bit boards and arrays. I don't suppose there is a version of a chess engine that does not have its own bit boards. Oh, well maybe. You got board.h. Um, hmm. Yeah, chess is going to be a difficult problem domain to which under which to find a engine that does not do stuff in a super complicated way. Um, okay, maybe this. Oh man, this still has arrays and stuff, but... I don't know, can I use corrode successfully? Um, corrode C Rust example. I, I did see that there was an incomplete um, documentation for porting from C to Rust. Uh, this book was somewhere. Um, <laughs> the dark arts of advanced and unsafe Rust programming. That's cool. That's totally where you should get started with the language, by the way. On the unsafe, no. And this to require on people on the internet to bail you out when you get in trouble. Um, uh, let's see if I can find a better example. Um, <laughs> oh, there's a presentation on Corrode. Um, that would probably be a reasonable place to start not for the fact that I'm actually streaming right now, and so I'd be using somebody else's content, um, which I can and am doing anyway, but I'm trying to make this something kind of more interactive and stuff. I'll note this. Uh, Jeremy Sharp on Corrode, uh, translating C to Rust. So, yeah. Uh, it was just over a year ago that he made this announcement. It's kind of a weird project in that there's not much code and uh, people do expect it to be big and scary and the, the answer is that no, it's actually not that big and not that scary because um, it, the problem space it tries to solve is rather limited. Um, well, I guess I should actually read this, right? Uh, I'd like to convince you that you can contribute to Corrode's development. In this post, I'll talk about some reasons why it's easier than it sounds, and some of the ways I'm thinking to make fast contribution or first contributions as painless as possible. Uh, if you just want to read up on how it works, check out detailed design documentation. So it's got type-directed development. Um, <laughs> wait, come back! <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. Corrode is developed in Haskell. Uh, everything I wrote has a simple Rust equivalent, just with different syntax. The reason I wrote it in Haskell is because I couldn't find a complete enough C parser for Rust. Uh, I was already familiar with the language C parser for Haskell. So, if you can write Rust, you can pick up enough Haskell to work on Corrode. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Rustonomicon. Um, did I... Yes. Um, I like how this contains the warning up front. I very much appreciate that. Um, I'm going to bookmark this and put off reading it uh, for a little while because reading a document that has... I mean, I... I recognize that people do a lot of wonderful things with Rust, um, and at the same time, like, uh, the fact that it says this is a draft document and this is dealing with uh, advanced and unsafe Rust programming 
does have me a little bit concerned. There aren't even any pictures to go alongside it to like try to make you more comfortable with it. Um, so this is a very technical, advanced sort of document that, you know, I probably shouldn't touch until I've gotten the basics of Rust down. Um, likewise, yeah, I do want to watch this video, but I can't exactly do that on stream. Because it's not like Creative Commons. If he had released this under a Creative Commons license, I would totally watch it together with all of us here. But uh, apparently only I release things under that license, so... Um, it's in fact quite unsafe. It's sprawling body imperfectly embalmed and infested with queer, queer animate things, which have nothing to do with it as it was in compilation. Yeah. I like the use of the word animate. Uh, I stumbled over that because I'm like, I know it means the opposite of inanimate, but there's also a verb I know, animate, and so I have to parse this garden path sentence to make sure I understand it properly. Um, but okay. Um, most compiler front-ends, the parser's job is to construct an AST, and language C is no different. I'm actually familiar with ASTs, so I can kind of skip that. Well. I, for our benefit, I'll go through it. Perhaps for my own, because I haven't seen ASTs in a while. Uh, take a look at the C. Language C syntax AST module defines a series of types, where each type looks like some piece of C syntax. Oh, good. Um, yeah, I was right. I could have skipped that. So you might wonder, well, a project like Corotas, how can we tell when we're done? Neat thing is the AST... Uh, types tell us exactly what cases we have to handle before we'll be able to translate all legal C programs. Once we've done a translation for every constructor of C expression, there's no way for language C to handle some magic other kind of expression it hasn't told us about. Yeah, once you've defined the grammar for your language, um, then you know what it is that needs to be translated. Um, as a result, the process of creating Corode it's been an almost mechanical cycle of finding... Oh, okay. Okay. That's an interesting development cycle there. Um, just finding one unimplemented case, thinking about how to do it in Rust, and writing code to translate that. That's actually pretty clever. And that's why he's saying that anybody can contribute. Because, like, any, it's a very iterative process. Uh, it defines a couple of common error reporting techniques. One is called unimplemented. Um, so you can look for unimplemented and figure out what's a reasonable way to implement it. Open issues tagged easy. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, switch and go to are tricky. Um, especially because in C you don't really necessarily need to have go to statements. Um, but, yeah, there's created a tracker called Easy. So, be a good introduction to hacking stuff in Corode. He's deliberately avoiding implementing these cases, except when they prevent him from finishing something else. When he was a resident at the Recurse Center a few weeks ago, some of the recursors pair program solutions to these easy tagged issues with him. These are all fairly small patches, and you could do this too. I might do it just somewhat out of my own amusement, but also somewhat just to get my name on the project, because it sounds like a decent thing uh, to be promoted. But if it's a lot of effort, maybe not. I don't know. It would help me better understand Rust, C, and Corrode. Uh, I have a decent understanding of C, though. But anyway... Literate programming uh, takes the usual emphasis of programming in its head instead of writing a bunch of machine-readable source code. Uh, literate programming, you'd write human-readable documentation has some machine-readable source scattered in it. For Corrode, there isn't very much source, but 
the assumptions and the rationale behind the implementation are intricate. Uh, I was going to write a detailed design doc to help other people get started, but then I realized I didn't want to, the documentation to refer to parts of the implementation, and you want to cross-reference. Um, the literate programming style is perfect for this. Oh, okay, so that, yeah, instead of writing a bunch of machine-readable code that has human-readable comments interspersed, it's, you write the documentation and then add some code to it. Okay. Um, so check out the source file of Corode, which is just Markdown. Um, the goal was to tell a story of why and how. And in there you can read the, the what. Um, so I'm not familiar with GHC. Uh, I see the word GitHub here. I see like C. I see Rust. But um, I assume GHC somehow does something. I don't know. Everybody here probably knows more than I do. Um, learning Haskell to produce code for a Tartly language that you're also learning. <laughs> well, when you put it that way, yes. Yes, that, that's exactly uh, what we're doing. <laughs> I mean, uh, I did take one brief glance into a Rust program. Um, what was it? I've even forgotten the name of it. And I just did this like a half hour ago. Oh, goodness. What was the name of this uh, chess engine in Rust? It was Krabby. Krabby was its name. And so I figured out how to compile it. I just had to like read the contents of this compiled document, install Rust and whatever, and then um, just say go compile this. And in fact, you can benchmark it too. Um, and then from here, oh, I remember I was trying to. Again, in a target language I'm not so familiar with, make this work with a stable compiler uh, instead of a future um, unsafe Rust compiler. I was just curious what the functional diff was. So I was looking through all the compiler errors with the uh, stable build. There were only a couple dozen of them, and many of those were fairly easily resolved, but um, they show like what are the newer features and more idiomatic Rust. Um, but also, like, I did peek into, like, some of the source code here, uh, source, uh, what was I looking at? What was it? Um, well, let's just take a look at evaluation.rs. And so, um, the only reason that this looks readable at all, um, that's because I've dealt with several languages, and um, I mean, a lot of this says we're going to define a function, and you say let a variable, or I'm not even sure if it's called a variable or a reference or whatever they want to call it here. Um, but I've, what, from what I've read of Rust, um, one thing that it'd be useful for corrode is for you to do things with pointers and references rather than pass by value. Um, so uh, I understand that Rust has features with uh, of like type safety and um, it's not possible to have null pointers occur in Rust. And so I'm assuming, perhaps wrongly so, that it's in a similar vein as Scala, as to Java. Um, so I'm assuming I could probably apply some of my background in other languages to what I'm seeing here. So the fact that I've dealt with some Scala, I've dealt with some Ruby before, means I have some chance of appreciating a language I've not yet worked with. Um, 
And I've also read that um, in Rust you can code in both a, I'm forgetting the word for function style, but you can do it that way, or you can do it in an imperative style uh, with statements executed in sequence. So you could say, like, here we are, eval plus equals, eval plus equals, and so forth. Um, and so you do have a ability to execute statements in sequence, but you also have this functional programming ability where you're able to define references or variables or whatever you call them here. And um, presumably immutability is useful in Rust. I don't know. I'm jumping way ahead of myself because I've not dealt with Rust, but um, it's a safer language than C. What kind of got me kind of curious about this in the first place is just and this is like the silliest reason to be interested in it um, but yeah there was some contention in the last day among upstream stockfish developers about like what to do when compiling um, stockfish and so you saw me turn to Seafish there, and I'm like, well, can I cross-compile Seafish to Rust? Is there, like, how feasible is it to do anything even remotely like what the ultimate goal would be, which would be um, cross-compiling the entire Stockfish engine from C++ to Rust, which would be a much larger endeavor. But if somebody can take Stockfish and code basically it in C, um, then I can start putting questions to people like, okay, you think we really need these compiler arguments? I don't know. Let's try this out in C, and C, I'm sorry, in C++. Let's try some equivalent code out in Rust and see that Rust is going to generate high-performing code without risk of errors. Um, and without risk of the compiler doing stupid things. Whereas uh, there is some contention among uh, developers here that some of these flags are good, some of the flags are bad, it's all black magic. It helps Stockfish like perform 3% faster if you have the flags enabled. And um, I had an opinion on this. Um, beyond my initial comment that says, um, you know, I'm pretty sure this doesn't actually increase the fish test resources. This might decrease the test quality, but it does not spend more test resources. Um, and I was going to ask, well, um, can't we just tell the compiler to do more expensive optimizations? But that's what the compiler already does. Um, this is, again, dealing with the profile build, where you're saying, I want to do a build that uses, um, that gathers statistics upon an initial compilation attempt um, that's got code profiling instrumentation in the code. And then um, what makes this particularly contentive is in Stockfish, Okay, here we have the target for profile use, right? But here we also have the target for profile make. And so, um, yeah, recently these uh, arguments got removed. So what this means is that we're going to do the build to start to profile the engine. And then after having done said profiling, we're going to apply the statistics. And maybe I have this backward, but I don't think I do. But yeah, after we gain the statistics, then compile the engine appropriately. And here we're hinting, in fact requiring to the compiler, don't do these other things that you would normally do as a result of the gathered statistics. Um, so, um, so these are some more advanced things that the compiler should be able to do. Um, but we're saying don't do it. Um, and maybe I have this backwards. Maybe this is for instrumentation, don't do these things. And when we actually do the uh, generation of the binary, maybe this is what gets executed. I'm not sure, but 
either way, we're um, saying that we're going to deal with some really advanced um, compiler options based on some very limited knowledge. Now, it is knowledge, though, so we can't entirely knock that. Um, so this is going way up the chain. This is the proposal to fix an issue that was raised based on, um, oh, where was it? But yeah, what got me down this path in the first place was that within the space of a week, uh, the maintainers of the Stockfish engine have flip-flopped their minds. Um, they've both decided, as they should, in my opinion, that we shouldn't be screwing around with compiler flags and we should let GCC do its thing for future proofing because otherwise when we make a code change it's possible the entire engine might start to behave very differently than it behaves right now. That's just the fear, uncertainty, and doubt there. That's not... Um, okay, and this is what I was basing my initial advice on. The, the flags for the uh, instrumentation build are different from those used for the final executable. And so for the final executable we're discarding the statistics we gathered all because uh, we have a 3% slowdown as we now know. We know that because some people measured it and they got 3%. Some people got 0%. Maybe some people got 6%. I don't know. But um, I guess in the name of whatever they're doing, yeah. Uh, so he's saying that I'm worried about this. I think... Anyway, so I was trying to find is that if compiling to Rust um, is able to generate all the safety uh, guarantees while maintaining a high performance, um, we don't have to screw around with compiler flags if we have a version of Stockfish in Rust. And while I can't exactly recommend that to the upstream Stockfish developers, um, I was curious just how far I could take us down a not well trodden path of um, is it possible to have a very high performing chess engine in Rust so we don't have to deal with this nonsense and so that we can easily cross compile it using the LLVM compiler and, you know that would just make everything so much easier but you, there's nothing for free um, um, so, again, I'm not sure what GHC is. Um, I know HG is mercurial, but GHC is uh, of some library and or toolkit that I installed. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, but you'd use this if you want to use Markdown in your Haskell source. Um, of course he knows how his own code works, so he doesn't understand what it is that he'd need to document for other people to understand his work. And I do appreciate that he actually gave a talk about his work, and yeah. He looks forward to our pull requests. Hey look, there's one open, easy open issue. Functions may be translated with the wrong environment. Consider this program. Um, so here we got this static void f g because f is static corrode to first translation until it encounters the g call um, because it was deferred it runs in the scope where the first call was encountered um, <laughs> that's clever um, result is that f translates as a 8-bit unsigned type, which is nonsense, and the Rust compiler sensibly reports mismatched types on the assignment. One way would be to get the environment state at the beginning of interpret function, um, and then inside the block, reset the environment state to the saved version, 
but this is a little tricky because we might not reset the global state of the initial G de declaration. Or, sorry, the initial F declaration. You want to retain that because you might have other contexts where you want to do X equals 1 for, well, I guess this is still static int x. What was the problem here? So the problem is that I have all kinds of guesses as to what the problem might be, but um, it translates the assignment x equals 1. Yeah, it believes that this is a type char. Oh, due to this context as opposed to that context. That's funny. Um, Alright, another person referenced this in May. Okay. Um, oh, somebody else is starting on this. I guess we could take a look at what's out there, because I assume most of the issues aren't easy. Oh, most of them aren't even estimated in terms of complexity. Yeah, I'm guessing that Corrode itself has a lot to gain in terms of maturity. Um, it'd be cool if it could do some things with arrays that it can't do at the moment. It crashes on some inputs. Um, I think something like this would encourage more people to use Corrode, maybe? Um, Bindgen has a distinct advantage in the Rust ecosystem that's easy and natural to use in a cargo build RS file. Fortunately, or ultimately, has to exist to improve. Written in Rust, um, to shimmer on the horizon. Um, offers a different promise: max oxidation. <laughs> Probably not for whole program conversion, but for piecemeal of tricky bits of code. Oh, interesting. So. Yeah, I did read that bindgen, this generates all the interfaces based on, I thought this was for C++, not for C. This crate is deprecated. Lovely. Um, so it must be this one that you're supposed to look at. It is under active development because the last commit was an hour ago. Um, generates the Rust FFI bindings to C and C++ libraries. And the idea is that you could add the Rust compiler to your toolkit for your environment. Um, so you could have a project introduced bindgen into it and slowly convert one file or one function at a time from C into Rust. Um, and this just generates all the necessary interface code, which was probably quite useful for um, people familiar. Well, I mean, it's useful for everybody. So this takes a slightly different tact instead of trying to build all the machine code, or not machine code, but instead of trying to build the contents of the functions, this just declares all the interfaces. Um, whereas Corrode is just better for um, um, translating 
uh, sections of code. It would be amazing if GCC or CLang or something um, had the ability to directly translate from one language to another. But um, again, that would be amazing because the languages are really complicated. Like, that's not even a sensible idea there. Um, Yeah, and I, I can understand how this is comparatively simple, and that you have a block of code, um, and you want to preserve this context here when executing this other context. Um, and I'm not sure that this is something that Corode would ever be good at. I'm not even sure that this is easy. I mean, what makes this appear easy is this one example, but in concept, um, you can even have static variables inside functions, or maybe I'm thinking of C++, but you can have a, a variable whose lifespan exceeds that of the function that it's declared in. If I remember right, you could say like static int x inside this function as opposed to above it. Uh, there's, yeah, this memory mapping stuff is not easy. I think he's a little bit mistaken, and um, I'd be more careful about starting on that. Um, data types are equally challenging, uh, at least if you're trying to do anything interesting with them. Um, <laughs> implement struct bit fields. Wait, what? Crow does not handle int 32. For... I'm confused. He doesn't know what bit fields... Oh, okay, that sort of bit field, I see. Yeah, so Rust doesn't really have an equivalent of a bit field. Um, you know, I wonder what's new in Rust. Rather than trying to deal with some of these really specific issues, um, and even Corrode is still fairly new, this is not a good place to start with learning Rust there. Sorry. Um... So, Rust program development cycle. Maybe I should look for like release notes. Um, also, probably search for Rust Lang instead of Rust. Okay, so here we got releases of Rust. Um, so, okay, this talks about. Let's scroll down to. I don't know. Last year. Um, so since last June, um, highlights. Uh, Rust C translates code to LLVM IR via its own um, intermediate IR or middle IR. Um, this translation pass is far simpler than the previous AST to LLVM. Increase opportunities to perform new optimizations directly on the MIR. Described on the Rust blog. This actually looks interesting. What else is new? Let's just focus on major releases. And it's great that we have tons of new APIs, and these will make Rust easier to use in the future. Stabilize the ternary operator. Um, stabilize macros attributes and statements. So yeah, Rust has evolved much faster than Corrode has, but has a lot more people working on it. And it surprised me just looking at Rust this morning. I saw like it has 5,000 open issues. Uh, like, how could this project in any way be in a good state with that many open issues? But the answer is because it's something that's all discussed much more and um, 
attempted much more with few, um, not necessarily future proof code. Oh, it's not a ternary operator. Okay, the question mark operator is something. It's a simple way to propagate errors, like the try macro described in an RFC. Oh, let's not go to the entire RFC. Let's go to just the operator. Um, so this is just a way to escalate errors um, or propagate errors across function boundaries, I suppose. I don't know. Um, it reminds me of how Ruby allows you to put exclamation points next to function names to do different things, but that's probably a very different concept. Oh, actually, this is just a subset. This is trait-based exception handling. Um, so for propagating exceptions, and catch expression for catching and handling exceptions. Um, So, yeah. Postfix operator can be applied to results and is equivalent to the current try macro. Um, either returns the OK value directly or performs an early exit and propagates the error uh, further out. So you don't need to say try everywhere. You can say, um, you can make your result type have the question mark instead. Otherwise you'd have try 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 all of your code base if you had exception handling of meaningful sorts. Um, so you could have multiple statements or even multiple function calls um, and execute them, execute them all in sequence and have your function that executes all these things return a type with a question mark and that sort of thing. seems like a pleasing balance between completely automatic exception propagation, which most languages do have, and a completely manual propagation, um, which would have apart from the try macro. Yeah. Seems like a reasonable compromise. Alright, so I'm gonna hit that other page soon, but not yet. Um, we have Rust uh, builds for various environments. <laughs> These are two tier or tier two platforms. It may have major defects, but here it is. If you want it, if you want to compile in MIPS, yeah, that's wonderful. Who wouldn't want to do Rust and MIPS? Um, safe function items can be coerced to unsafe function pointers. Use star and use scope star are both glob import from the crate root. Um, it's now possible to create a vector of boxed functions without explicit dereferencing. That's pretty advanced stuff. Yeah. Uh, dot dot matches multiple tuple fields. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, pattern matching or matching in general is something that's getting more sophisticated as I see in the unstable aspects of, um, what was it, Krabby, the chess engine. It's doing even more advanced, um, maybe even dynamic dispatch, I'm not sure. Probably not, but, um, but Krabby does some advanced matching parsing, uh, even more so than what was discussed in that release note below. Um, Basic procedural macros along custom derive 
are stable. So that's popular code generating crates to work ergonomically. Uh, tuple structs may be empty. Unary and empty tuples uh, may be instantiated. Whoa. Wow. Jeez. That's impressive. Oh my goodness. That's like... That's a pretty fundamental language decision there. Um, tuple structs may be empty, sure, but allowing curly braces to instantiate a tuple makes um, the work for the compiler that much more difficult. Um, number of minor changes to name resolution have been activated. Um, let's allow Let's add up more. Add, uh, let's add up to more consistent semantics. Uh, macro rules, path fragments can now be parsed as type parameter bounds. Size can be used in where clauses, and um, there's now a limit on the size of monomorphized types that can be modified. Oh. This is good. This prevents your compiler from spinning endlessly. Um, yeah, if you have... Yeah, that, that could get quite ugly. Um, okay, the compiler's dead code lint now accounts for type aliases. Um, Uh, there's a lot of interesting semantic decisions that are being made with the language maturing. I'm sure there's ample discussion by all these developers and contributors um, over these pretty fundamental decisions. In many ways, this is a much more distributed than, say, C is. Where C does have the language specification committee, but this is pretty widely and openly discussed in the issue trackers um, and maybe even some external forum I've not checked. Um. <laughs> Stabilize the Windows subsystem attribute. Um. Conservative exposure of the subsystem linker flag on Windows platforms. Now ty and macros can accept types like write and send. Uh, OE plus 10 is now a valid floating point literal. Or 0E. Uh, now one warns if you attempt to bind a lifetime parameter to a static. And tuples, enum, variant fields, structs with no REPR attribute are reordered to wow wow we're doing tuple packing that's crazy or enum packing um tuple structs enums all this are um that's crazy that you would do that kind of optimization uh let's check what the rfc for windows says Always allocate a console window at startup. The behavior is controlled via the subsystem parameter passed to the linker, and so can be overridden with uh, specific compiler flags. However, doing so will bypass the Rust specific initialization code in libstd. As when using the MSBC toolchain, the entry point must be named win main. Uh, RC proposes supporting this case explicitly allowing libstd to continue to be initialized correctly. The motivation is the Windows subsystem is commonly used on Windows. Uh, desktop applications typically do not want to flash up a console window on startup. Currently, when using the Windows subsystem from Rust is undocumented, um, and this process is non-trivial when targeting MSBC toolchain. There are a couple of approaches, each with their own downside. One, to find a win main symbol which is unsafe because Windows is unsafe. Um, now there's override the entry point in the linker options. Um, 
that's a bit complicated too. Uh, this uses the same method as will be described in the RFC, or this RFC. However, it will result in build scripts um, also being compiled for the Windows subsystem, which can create additional console windows to pop up during compilation, making the system unusable while a build is in progress. So, drawbacks. Um, difficulty of manually calling the Rust initialization code is potentially a more general problem. Subsystem must be specified earlier than is strictly required. Um, since when compiling the C++ code using only the linker, uh, you still need to be aware of the subsystem. Uh, so we have possible alternatives, but um, <laughs> unresolved questions. None. Oh, well, that's okay. Cool. Good to hear. We understand Windows. Um, that that's pretty special. Yeah, that's the Windows subsystem attribute. Um, so what we're doing right now is catching up on Rust. Um, because this is like my initial exposure to a pretty awesome language, um, which has really strong guarantees. Um, it might or might not be simpler to develop in than other languages, but the fact that it has this stability to it means that if, say, you had some program process um, or some a kind of anything, and you were to do it in Rust and do it in C, you could compare the results. And over time, eventually, your Rust results would tell you, could benchmark for you what you should expect in your C program. And, you know, I think eventually Rust will mature to a point where people will prefer it over C, maybe even C++, I don't know. I think Rust still has a long way to go, um, but it, now that it has Windows integration, now that, I mean, they've greatly expanded all their libraries and APIs, um, and this does target the LLVC compiler so you can generate more optimized bytecode um, that works well in browsers and in distributed executables or portable executables. Um, I think they're on a good path to becoming a very um, widely used, well I mean they are widely used, but they're going to be even more widely used soon. That probably doesn't make any sense, but we're just going to see a greater and greater acceptance of this language over time as it becomes easier to use and as it matures. Uh, some things that are done in C and C++ for pretty scary reasons still can't be done in Rust, but uh, so in that, sense, in that sense Rust is a lot safer and that it doesn't allow you to um, I don't know, I wonder how you would manage to shoot your leg off doing things with Rust. It'd be a lot trickier than doing it in C. But, um, when you invent a good tool, the world invents even better idiots. So, um, yeah, so today, this refers to last year, you had Rust source, and you were translating this into LMVM IR, directly into machine code. Um, and so now we in, Rust introduces an intermediate layer here um, that allows them to better translate into more optimal uh, low-level IR, or intermediate representation. Uh, so you can hand to the virtual machine here. I think that's the VM stands for in LLVM. Um, but you can hand to it um, a copy of the code that's um, more packed, more optimized, and so forth. And so you'd have a not only safe binary, because um, Rust does compile 
it offers all kinds of type safety and runtime guarantees based on the semantics of how you code things in Rust. Not that I know the language particularly well, but it offers many great guarantees. Um, and now they're introducing a more performant way of compiling um, after having done all the type checking and making sure that yes we can compile it and then just hand it over to another intermediate representation to produce machine code. We're going to try to um, do some optimization um, using this in intermediate representation. So all these steps are still the same, um, but now there's this intermediate layer that allows them to better define and better optimize things. Um, I did notice that my Rust programs that I've tried to compile this morning do compile quite quickly. Um, but yeah, it helps to have an intermediate representation that gives some structure to your optimization. Um, as opposed to just having one block of binary, uh, one block of, I'm struggling with what you would call it, but having a whole bunch of object files. And basically making that one file and telling the compiler to go optimize everything all at once would be pretty not efficient. Not to mention that if you just edit one of the files and regenerate the object for all of the files put together, um, that's a lot of wasted effort. So incremental compilation is now possible. Now that we have this intermediate representation, you edit one source, it edits one intermediate representation, and then all the intermediates are compiled together into the LLVM intermediate representation, which eventually gets translated to machine code. Um, and somehow this guarantees faster execution time as well. Um, this is what I was trying to speak about earlier, is Rust-specific optimizations um, that are based on the semantics of Rust that the LVLVM could not have known about the objects that are being passed to it. Um, in addition, this will uncork some long-standing performance improvements. Um, not so familiar with this. Um, with more precise type checking. Uh, so I guess this allows us to enforce type checking earlier in the process. Instead of doing it for the entire um, program, now for some subset of the program, some subset of the source, you can do type checking in, against your intermediate representation and get a more precise error message back, which is clever. Uh, yeah, there's no need to have the LLVM struggle with things that Rust understands, and um, it's just easier to produce these intermediate representations. As it, honestly, this has been similar to C and other languages. You can generate um, intermediate. Uh, I'm struggling with what it's called, but I've seen like you can generate compiled header files as well, and you can generate dependency files. And oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about the GNU tool chain. Um, it generates all kinds of intermediate um, files to help optimize your build. And so yeah, the more intermediate and the more representations you have, um, the greater granularity you have over the entire process. And yes, it requires some more work to generate all these files in terms of them developing the toolkit. But um, once the toolkit's developed, um, everything runs smoother with a more sophisticated and complex toolkit. Um, MIR reduces Rust down to a simple core, removing all the Rust syntax they use every day. Instead, the constructs are translated to a small set of primitives. Uh, it does not mean the MIR is a subset of Rust. Uh, yeah, the primitives operations are not even available in real Rust because they could be used to 
write unsafe or undesirable programs. The simple core that MIR supports is not something you'd want to program in. Okay. So yeah, if you have all your type checking and um, rules enforced up front, then the actual compiler does not need to check these things a second time. And the actual compiler is not the word I'm looking for, but um, once you've produced all your objects, then, and you know that they follow all the semantics of the language, there's no need to check all those semantics a second time during um, the, uh, I want to say compile step, but that doesn't feel right at all, but during the assembly step, which is actually later, or some intermediate step. So our REST example starts as this for loop which iterates over all elements and processes them one by one. Rust offers three kinds of loops, for like this, and while loops and while let loops, um, which iterate until some conditions met. And then finally the simple loop, which just iterates until you break out of it. Each of these kinds of loops encapsulates a particular pattern, so are quite useful when writing code. But for MIR, you'd like to just have one representation of a loop instead of four. Uh, representations. So convert a value into an iterator and repeatedly call next. And then this manner we can remove all the for loops but uh, still leaves multiple kinds of loops around so next we can imagine rewriting all while let loops and so on and so forth. Um, this is like the concept of it's not reduction. There's a uh, I want to say induction I'm thinking like proof by induction though. Uh, simplifying match expressions. One of the big goals in MIR was to simplify matches to a small core of operations. You get to do this by introducing two constructs that the main language does not include, switches and variant downcasts. Uh, like go to, these are things we do not want to include in the base language because they can be misused. But in the intermediate representation, they can be used. So yeah, there's all kinds of more advanced things they can do in this intermediate representation that they don't allow you to do up front because Rust is a safe language. Um, but its intermediate steps don't have to be safe. Um, there's all kinds of optimizations that are discussed here. And conclusion, let's jump onto here because I am running a bit low on time. I expect the use of MR to be the intermediate representation would be quite transformative in terms of what the compiler can accomplish. By reducing the language to a core set of primitives, MIR opens the door to a number of language improvements. We looked at drop flags in this post. Another example would be uh, improving Rust's lifetime system to leverage the control flow graph for better precision. Uh, I think there will be many applications that we haven't foreseen. For example, one has such a risen. Scott Olson has been making great strides developing an MIR interpreter, and its techniques in exploring uh, may well form the basis for a more powerful constant evaluator in the compiler itself. So that's clever. Um, the transition to MIR in the compiler is not yet complete. So I guess you would call the first step like the pre-compiler or the preprocessor, I'm not exactly sure. But they make this distinction that the compiler itself takes the MIR and does the compilation. So I was right earlier, even though I thought it wasn't, that compile best describes what we do with MIR to produce the LLVM, and then ultimately the um, machine code. Um, you guys probably aren't too familiar with LLVM, so I'll take a minute to just touch on that. Um, I want to say that it's a virtual machine. I'm not entirely familiar what it stands for, but um, it allows um, some intermediate representation. Not, not like this, but I'm thinking more like the Java virtual environment, or the Java runtime environment. Um, Java itself compiles into a Java binary object file. 
Um, and by that I mean your own source code that you write in Java is compiled into object files, but those object files um, run under the Java runtime environment, which that runtime environment is able to, it's pretty high performance. It's gotten to a point where it performs similarly to other languages. Um, I believe LLVM is similar in that vein, but it works for browsers and possibly other de uh, devices. I'm thinking of mobile devices, but I might be mistaken there, but a virtual environment or a container would give you the ability to have um, some third party produce a tool that works well across a variety of architectures. And you don't need to worry about producing object files or executables for every particular architecture. You would just produce a object file or a portable executable of some sort. Um, I might be confusing and conflating there because I'm not so familiar, but you would produce binaries and then distribute these to the clients and the clients could say, okay, we got all these binaries. I know how to translate in a very efficient manner, take this binary you gave me and turn it into machine level code. And so it makes for very portable executables um, when there's a common binary representation that some library is capable of uh, interpreting across a variety of environments. And that interpretation could just also be direct execution if you had a hypothetical machine that didn't need to um, to downscale or not to that did not need to compile to uh, machine code. You could just have a well similar to what they're talking about here you could have an interpreter um, and when you have an interpreter you could just run the code using an interpreter rather than compiling it. Um, and this gives you many ways of writing your own interpreter and seeing do some perform fundamentally better or worse than others and if so um, then maybe there are some cases under which we want the compiler to do one thing or to do a different thing. Uh, but yeah, their goal here is to compile from Rust into the LLVM and then let the LLVM handle um, the details of your particular um, architecture for whatever architectures or they choose to support. Um, again, that's all really technical mumbo jumbo. What got me into this, perhaps for the wrong reason, was that I was finding um, that the Stockfish team was trying to figure out how best to optimize Stockfish, and I set forth, perhaps a bit foolishly, trying to see, well, or naively is a better word, I was curious, not just for the sake of the Stockfish engine, but also just my own understanding in general. Um, what's Rust in the state? What state is Rust in at the moment? What kind of um, things do I need to be aware of or careful of when dealing with Rust? Um, and for one really great example here was the Krabby library uh, by I don't have the author here, but here's the URL, Johnson A, um, and yeah, this gets its name from the Rust mascot, uh, Ferris the Crab. Um, and yeah, what really tipped me off about well, this is something special in Rust, is that this is not working with the safe Rust compiler. This is using some features that might in the future become part of Rust and does all these really advanced things that Stockfish does too. So I was just curious, like, well, this is great to hear. How difficult is it to take a much more mature uh, program and try to um, see what aspects of it can readily be interpreted in Rust or translated to Rust? and. I think probably the best bet is to just go with bind gen, generate all the interfaces, and then one by one translate all the classes, which is an enormous amount of work, particularly because Rust doesn't safely support um, 
some things that are in this particular engine. I think if somebody could make a chess engine doing it in Rust and still have all these features and maybe even have an efficient representation and execution using bit boards and um, bit vector types and things that don't really work at all in Rust. But if they had that, um, there really would be no excuse for people to be doing things in C. Well, no, there's good reasons to do things in C, but it has nothing to do with um, algorithms or science. It has much more to do with your choice of libraries. But for standalone applications, Rust is looking more and more appealing. Um, it still has a way to go to be used for scientific or chess purposes, but um, yeah, this is more been a session about me learning than it has been about me instructing. Um, I find that usually about, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's more or less than half of these. I spend more time learning and not so much time uh, pointing out exactly everything I'm doing. I'm not sure that there's a big difference to my viewership here in terms of do you guys want me to just talk while I'm coding stuff? Because that's kind of boring if you, nobody really tunes in for that. Um, I mean, ideally you'd have me talk while I had a pre-prepared lecture. And I knew that everything was going to go right. And I knew exactly how I was going to go through lecturing something. That would, That's kind of the ideal format that works for everybody. It works in a university setting. But it has the downside that requires a lot of investment to do it. Um, a lot of investment of time and or resources. Um, and then we have on this opposite extreme, me just learning stuff, trying to talk of my thoughts about it instead of just reading it. Um, and that's I don't think that's ideal either because this is just my stream of consciousness and really wouldn't make sense to people other than those already familiar with all the core concepts. And I think for that purpose it's pretty comedic, but it's very high brow comedy that like nobody would get so um by nobody i mean just most viewers probably don't understand what i'm doing and even if i try to explain it it's me trying to learn things i'm not sure how well i can do at explaining that um i think um even to get to the point where i can demonstrate that I'm learning things requires considerable effort. Um, I think a more middle of the road approach would be I have some goals set forth for a stream, some project I want to work on, and I have an approach in mind and ideally I'd have some sort of visual component that would demonstrate my learning. But having such visual components is challenging in itself. Um, and even when I did that, there wasn't a great interest in that either. Um, but ideally, I, I would do something more like this, where you could see, like, hey, I've got this lunar lander that I'm programming, and you could see it succeed and fail, and you could see it, like, collect all the dots and this stuff. And, you know, if Musk hadn't sold this out to Microsoft, maybe I'd be more interested in doing more with it. Uh, I don't blame him. Um... Microsoft really could benefit from this sort of thing, and Musk probably wants to distance himself from it for some reason, or I don't know, wants to embrace Microsoft because they have resources to do more with it. Um, but I liked when it was more of a part of the open source community. Um, anyway, that's just me learning stuff. Um, I'll try to do more instructive stuff in the future because this these sessions about me just randomly picking pieces of documentation. I did find uh, <laughs> the Rustonomicon. I could do a read through of stuff like this. That might also be interesting. Um, just reading through technical documentation, offering my thoughts on that, because at least there's a substance here as opposed to me just jumping here, then here, then here. I, I think that's a bit too much for everybody to follow. Um, but yeah. We will learn more. We will um, have greater successes in the future. Um, for our first introduction to Rust, I think of making decent progress with it. You guys probably want to see me actually run 
the engine here. Um, so if I've got this in my history, I don't. Um, I forget how to run this. Uh, I think it was like target release uh, crabby. Um, yeah, sorry I don't recall. I'll see if I can run this here. If not, I just have to run. Um, I do have to go very soon. But yeah, check out the Krabby Rust Chess Engine. I'll maybe have a contest between Stockfish versus Krabby. I did install just this morning uh, the Cute Chess uh, command line interface, which um, I can use to run multiple engines against each other. However, I have to um, um, I have to have the full paths for those engines here, um, and I don't think I have this set up right. Oh wait, no, I had started this. Um, I did even edit this test script to be able to run it without using Dropbox. Um, so I had to do test.sh. And then I had to do like target release crabby. And then I had to say target release crabby again. And your guys are probably not wanting to see the test results there, but you want to see all the IO. Um, oops. Uh, I have to put debug in here if we want to see the I.O. Otherwise, if it's interpreted as an engine name. But yeah, just to demonstrate that Krabby can, in fact, play chess. Well, you know, it was good in concept. Hey, welcome. Sorry, I, I actually do need to run now. Um, more urgent matters do require my attention. But, you know, I'll... Experiment with this, see if I can get a Krabby versus Stockfish um, contest going. Maybe even contribute something meaningful to Krabby, because it's cool to have an engine that's written um, in Rust. Um, so you could find this Krabby chess engine. Uh, you can find this over here at um, github.com, Johnson A. Krabby. And yeah, here's how you're supposed to compile it. Here's all the features it has. I was able to execute it this morning and somehow today or right now I'm not. I don't understand why not. I'd have to look more into it. So apologize for not getting that working. Um, but yeah, this is last contributed to uh, in June. Oh, last year. Bummer. Um, so my initial thought was, well, if I could just make this a little bit easier for people to run on um, versions of Rust other than the nightly build, that'd be great. But I also see that Rust is accelerating quite quickly. Maybe if Rust catches up just a little bit more, it'll make it easier for me to um, be able to do this sort of change. Such You don't have to install this very highly specialized compiler to run it. Usually it's just Cargo Run. I mean, you could give Cargo Run a try. Um, that might have part, yeah, that might help. Oh, um, thread main panicked at attempt to subtract with overflow. Um, so I've probably done something bad here, somehow. I don't even know how I could have messed this up. Um. We'll give this one more try, but I really do have to go, too. Yeah, it did try to run something. That's most appreciated. I think Cargo Run did the main compile step, and yeah, this... Um, there's warnings everywhere, but... Yeah, and then I could... If I wanted a full backtrace, I'd say Rust backtrace equals 1, and this shows exactly where this failed. Um, Get status. Is 
there's some way to reset my environment. Um, I don't know. Let's see. CD target. Uh, CD release. Oh man, I don't know how to make clean in this, but yeah, I have a feeling that I'm going to be stuck for a while. Rust may also have changed, you're right. Um, yeah, I might have introduced this kind of safety catch that um, might no longer be possible in the nightly build. Um, oh, cargo run release. Oh, in fact, um, yeah, I'm sorry, that's what it says um, in the readme file, I had forgotten. Um, yeah, you have to compile it here. Uh, if you want to use native CPU features, do all this stuff. In fact, yeah, if you're building, you have to use cargo build release to bypass that check. So, either way, um, yeah, look forward to this. Um, we'll pick it up maybe this afternoon. Um, I've got a meeting to go attend, so yeah, thanks for watching. It's been fun. We'll let this compile. It'll take a while. And uh, I'll see you next time. Maybe you'll be done compiling by then. I'm joking, but yeah, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for your help. And we'll pick this up at a later time. Have a good day.